Welcome to Live from Size Lounge, showcasing alumni of Iowa State University and Cyclones Everywhere, making communities, Iowa, and the world a better place. Hello, Cyclones Everywhere, and welcome into Live from Size Lounge. My name is Matt Van Winkle with the ISU Alumni Association. We want to say hello to everyone watching, especially our alumni and friends from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. This is LAS Week on campus, and we are excited to be partnering with the college for our interview today. We are pleased to have Dr. Lauren Hughes joining us today. A 2002 graduate with degrees in zoology and Spanish, Hughes has gone on to have an accomplished career in health medicine and policy. She is currently a practicing family physician, associate professor of family medicine, and the State Policy Director of the Farley Health Policy Center at the University of Colorado, where she leads initiatives to translate data for policymakers, helping to inform the design and implementation of evidence-based health policy. So please help me welcome Lauren Hughes to Live from Size Lounge. Hey, Lauren, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much, Matt. How are you? Doing well. As I mentioned, it is LAS week. And as I mentioned also in your intro that you have a double uh, major, you double majored here at Iowa State. And uh, tell us about what that was like to, to be a double major uh, at Iowa State. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I, I love my, uh, my years at Iowa State. In fact, yeah, I was yeah. so set on uh, uh, becoming a cyclone that I only ever applied to Iowa State University. So the decision was pretty easy as to where to go. And I always knew that I wanted a strong, you know, liberal arts um, focus in, in my training at my undergraduate um, level. And zoology, you know, contained all the, the courses that I needed to prepare me for a career in medicine. Um, but I also uh, had studied Spanish in high school and so it and studied abroad in Spain um, when I was at Iowa State. So it was easy to add um, that other uh, degree as well. So. Lauren, you're currently an associate professor of family medicine and the state policy director of the Farley Health Policy Center at the University of Colorado. Can you explain to our audience what you do in these roles? Absolutely. Well, in many ways in, in my bio, you sort of described the associate professor hat um, of my role. And um, as an associate professor of family medicine, I practice um, outpatient uh, family medicine in one of our clinics um, here in Denver. And I spend most of my time in the Farley Health Policy Center as a state policy uh, director. And the Farley Center is a nonpartisan objective policy center that is on uh, the medical school campus affiliated with the University of Colorado. And in that role, I do several things. I conduct uh, policy research. I mentor uh, students, residents, fellows, and faculty who are uh, interested in pursuing uh, health policy careers. And I also help serve as a resource for state and federal policymakers that are looking to design and implement uh, policies and programs that affect the health of Coloradans and our Mountain West neighbors. You've done a lot of research and work around rural health care policy. Why is this such an area of interest to you, especially with a background coming from Iowa? Is this something maybe that sparked your interest in working in rural health care policy? No, absolutely. I, you know, I grew up in rural East Central Iowa. So in many ways, uh, being engaged in rural health policy is a way for uh, me to give back uh, to my home state, but also more broadly, rural communities across, across the country. 20% of Americans live in rural America and are critical to the food and energy and recreation that the rest of us uh, depend on. But I have found in my career that many rural Americans feel that their health and health care uh, needs and priorities may be misunderstood or perhaps have been overlooked by, by policy uh, makers. And by focusing on rural health policy, I love to uh, work hard to ensure that trusted leaders with uh, you know, rural health expertise and lived experiences are in positions that allow them to shape and influence uh, policies that affect uh, their lives, and also to help build transformational leadership capacity among rural health leaders so that they are more effectively able to, uh, to identify and solve problems on their own within their, their rural health communities and, and healthcare uh, delivery systems um, locally. And we've also seen from multiple studies that 
uh, there are significant inequities in health outcomes that exist between rural and urban communities. Um, compared to their urban counterparts, uh, rural Americans are more likely to die from heart disease, cancer, stroke, uh, chronic lung disease, and unintentional um, injury. This means that there are lots of opportunities to improve policies, systems, and structures that truly uh, impact the array of choices that rural Americans have um, at their disposal in their local environment to be able to lead healthy lives. This past year, a global pandemic has affected the lives of people across the world. We saw hospitals overwhelmed with COVID patients, people struggling to get access to testing, and overall, just a lot of unknown with this virus. You've been studying the barriers rural communities are facing during the pandemic. What did you learn about this issue and how can we address those barriers moving forward, Lauren? Great question, Matt. And um, the reality is that we have uh, faced numerous challenges uh, you know, during, uh, during this pandemic. The first of which has been challenges of clinical care. Um, and this is not a challenge that is unique to rural healthcare by any means. Certainly rural and urban healthcare systems um, have been rapidly, um, in many ways, building the plane while we fly it. Um, it, it just a little over a year ago, we first heard of COVID-19 and that, you know, this new illness entered our, our vocabulary. And as you can imagine, there have been rapidly evolving, not just public health protocols, but protocols around diagnosis and treatment. Of course, the um, you know, development of uh, now three vaccines that we have available um, for use here in, in, in the US. And you know, the need to keep up to date on information and still being able to access um, healthcare in the midst of a public health emergency illustrates the importance of ensuring moving forward that we uh, introduce um, adequate broadband in rural communities across the country and make sure that they are highly uh, networked. Uh, in a situation like this, in the midst of a, of a pandemic, this is important. Telehealth um, you know, that you can have with better broadband is important for patients and for uh, healthcare providers um, alike. For patients, it means that they don't have to travel uh, into the city and can access, uh, for example, specialty, specialty care. They may need a consultation um, from the comfort of their, of their own homes. And for rural healthcare teams, again, with a new a new illness, you know that they were you know learning learning to care for, they have access to be able to ask questions of their of their colleagues in you know larger facilities or in urban um, healthcare systems. And so, um, broadband allows us to have higher quality telehealth that improves healthcare for uh, rural patients and for their their providers as well. We've learned a great deal more about the. The different factors that set up rural America and rural communities to be more vulnerable to COVID-19 as compared to uh, in, in cities. You know, we have seen in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles, um, you know, for example, that, you know, population density is the leading factor that drives um, infection rates. But when you think about rural America, population density isn't top of that list. In rural, semi-rural, and micropolitan um, communities, the factors that will drive greater vulnerability and susceptibility to COVID-19 infection include, um, you know, the percentage of population over 65, uh, you know, nursing home residents, uh, individuals in jails and prisons and military barracks, those that are working at meat and poultry processing facilities. These represent pockets of vulnerable populations in different rural settings across the country. So this is important to keep in mind, uh, you know, in the near future, if additional variants of COVID-19 emerge and in the future for, you know, when the next epidemic or pandemic arrives here, especially if it's transmitted in a similar way as what COVID-19 is, that we need to keep this experience in mind in that perhaps one size fits all public health guidance. So for example, business closures, school closures, uh, shelter in place orders may make sense in an urban environment where you have greater population density, but perhaps those types of public health orders may not make sense in, in rural America. Rather, we need to focus on identifying and protecting vulnerable uh, populations to mitigate the spread of, of disease. We also have seen uh, in this pandemic 
that rural healthcare delivery systems, so hospitals, public health departments, primary care um, you know, practices, along with businesses, nonprofit organizations, and the faith community in rural, uh, in rural settings, have collabor- collaborated in ways that they may, um, haven't, they may have not done um, in the past. And many of these communities are finding that this collaboration is essential for addressing this public health uh, emergency. And what I hope coming, you know, coming out of a pandemic is that this collaboration will not um, be limited to just, uh, you know, an emerging infectious disease, but collaboration can be effective in taking on other public health challenges like obesity, improving walkability in rural communities, uh, and improving uh, cancer, you know, screening rates uh, moving forward. Two more challenges that I'd like to, you know, like to highlight in the rural health space. And the first is around the financial health of our rural health care delivery systems. Uh, in this pandemic, rural primary care and rural hospitals have struggled um, with um, you know, financial uh, difficulties. And many of these entities didn't enter the pandemic in a particularly a strong financial um, position to begin with. If you recall in the early months of the pandemic, many hospitals um, stopped elective procedures, both in rural and urban areas. And primary care practices were saying, you know, unless you are having a very active issue or very concerning symptoms, maybe just pause, you know, for coming in right now until we get a handle, you know, on, uh, on this pandemic. The challenge of this, you know, really relates to the underlying um, mechanism, predominant mechanism of how we pay for healthcare services in this country, which is based on volume. More people means more procedures, tests, visits, and hence more revenue coming into that healthcare system. In rural America, we don't have large volumes. Some communities are holding steady, others are having fluctuating um, you know, population levels, and other communities um, have declining um, you know, populations for a wide you know, variety of reasons. This is in light of you know, continued um, operating expenses for rural healthcare delivery systems that continue to, to increase. And so you have a you know, financially sort of tenuous um, position, particularly um, after, you know, on the heels of, of this past year. So moving forward, I'd love to see us continue to experiment and innovate with new payment and delivery models for rural healthcare delivery systems that may not be as based in the volume of services rendered as what we currently see in our in our fee for service um, system. And last but certainly not least, um, and you touched upon this in the in the intro to this question, Matt, which is around uh, supplies. Um, you know, early on, we recall the stories that it was a challenge to get needed personal protective equipment to protect you know healthcare workers, to get needed medications, equipment, um, and other and other goods that they needed to take care of of patients. Uh, in addition to the difficulty in sourcing these items, rural healthcare delivery systems, along with their urban counterparts, were facing uh, a pretty steep price gouging um, at a time when they, again, they were you know struggling uh, financially to stay afloat, pay the bills, make payroll, um, etc. But our rural healthcare delivery systems, um, a lot of them got very, very creative. So they had their healthcare vendors, yes, but they also started sourcing these needed supplies from auto and paint suppliers from agricultural and veterinary medicine um, suppliers. And I think moving forward, you will see rural healthcare delivery systems permanently diversify um, their supply chains, which will be uh, incredibly uh, important uh, moving forward. So much good information there. Thanks for sharing all that. But as we, as we look at um, the ways that this pandemic has affected people um, like you working in healthcare directly with patients, um, people that were on the front lines, um, our healthcare providers, what changes or policy would you like to see put in place to make sure that our healthcare workers are taken care of the next time there's a global health crisis like this, especially um, when we saw so much um, overwhelming of the hospitals and, and burnout among those providers? Absolutely. Well, the last word you said there, Matt, is, is where I'd like to um, pick up, which is around uh, burnout. And I think the biggest change that we can make in caring for our healthcare workforce moving forward is to recognize that burnout and the associated symptoms of, of depression and increased risk of suicide are not necessarily individual faults, but failures of the systems in which 
they, uh, they work. As healthcare workers, we are human as well, and we have limits. And it's important for us to take care of ourselves and to engage in, in self-care so that we are able to uh, be fully present and take care of patients and families. All too often in this pandemic, uh, I have seen, appropriately so, our healthcare workers, especially those that are on the front lines of emergency departments, ICUs, and, and primary care, be elevated and celebrated in the media as heroes. I worry about what happens to those colleagues of mine when the cameras uh, turn away and when we turn our attention you know, to, other, uh, to other issues. Moving forward, it will be incredibly important for us to not stop our focus on burnout mitigation by simply suggesting to a colleague to take a break from social media or to um, perhaps sign up for a, a yoga class. But rather, we need to improve warning systems and training at all levels within healthcare organizations so that we are better able to uh, identify colleagues that may be struggling with burnout and get them to the help that they need um, sooner before it's too late. You got your education. You started your long education uh, right here at <laughs> Iowa State uh, here in Ames uh, with degrees in zoology and Spanish, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. And Lauren, Iowa State graduates just like you are making their communities, the state of Iowa right here, and the world a better place. How do you feel your degrees help prepare you to make a difference in the work that you're doing today? Absolutely. So as I mentioned you know, earlier, Matt, certainly my, my degree has prepared me necessarily for all the you know, requisites I needed for you know, entering a career in medicine. But I certainly appreciated uh, having access to a liberal arts education where I you know, was taught how to think critically, how to um, ask the difficult questions, to be comfortable with ambiguity and complexity. And my Iowa State education also opened my worldview. It helped foster a sense of curiosity and uh, connection to those with very different lived experiences than me. And also taught me that uh, failure isn't something to be afraid of, that it's okay to take risks and to try something new and to learn a new skill. And, and all of these things are a really important foundation for my career and have been, especially uh, in health policy, which can be uh, pretty fast paced um, at times, uh, you know, detail oriented, you have to engage a lot of different stakeholders with different perspectives, uh, different ideas for, you know, solutions. And so all of those things that, that my, uh, you know, undergraduate training, um, you know, taught me have been incredibly valuable for, uh, you know, for me as I've moved forward in, in my career. Well, we got news here in our state that all Iowans will be eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine in early April. I'm curious what excites you and gives you hope for better days ahead as we approach the end of this pandemic. There are many things actually that give me, uh, that give me hope and make me excited for all of us as we move forward. And, uh, you know, again, I'm, uh, my, my leading reason to be excited and be hopeful is what you just mentioned, the, the vaccine. And I, I delight in seeing, um, you know, new surveys come out pretty frequently that indicate an increasing interest in getting the COVID-19 vaccine and also decreasing hesitancy around questions related, you know, related to the vaccine. And, you know, this to me means that more people are um, protecting themselves, protecting their families, protecting their communities by, uh, by getting the vaccine. And I am delighted um, to see that. That is a critical step for us to move toward herd immunity and be able to move on to the recovery um, phase from uh, this global pandemic. Certainly the, you know, COVID-19 has uh, disrupted our lives in numerous um, ways. It's forced us to pause. We didn't choose this, we didn't expect it. Um, so it forced our hand to pause. It also forced us to be patient and to be present in our lives, perhaps in ways that we haven't before. And I find this encouraging because I've had many friends and family, myself included, uh, develop new hobbies and um, uh, you know, explore nature and stay connected with friends and family and, and members in, in different ways and fostering uh, community virtually and learning you know, how, to, how to do that. Uh, examining uh, priorities in life and, 
and, and sort of appreciating a less um, scheduled or perhaps a less um, hectic lifestyle. And I am excited to see what, um, you know, what I would choose moving forward from this pa pandemic based on what I've learned in the past year and, and um, that of which my, my friends and family uh, might choose as, as well. And lastly, you know, we certainly as a society have been dealing with some very, very tough issues over the past year. Of course, there's been COVID. There's also been increasing political divisions, um, systemic racism, particularly against our, our Asian and Black communities um, in this country, misinformation, the economic downturn. These are not easy things. And I have seen so many in my life that are that are digging into these issues for perhaps the first time, um, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, asking uh, tough questions, uh, listening intently to those answers and committing to change. And I see all of this as, a, uh, as hopeful and perhaps as a signal that we are collectively committing to moving forward together toward better. And not necessarily returning to quote unquote normal, because maybe that's no longer the direction that we wish to go in. You know, as we move through this recovery phase, it's important uh, to, to engage in activities that uh, help you process all that has happened. And this could be, you know, journaling, this could be exercise, this could be uh, engaging in um, some of these new, these new hobbies, talking with friends and family, whatever is your, your outlet, uh, important to engage in those, um, for your own, uh, for your own, uh, self-care. Yeah. So much good information there. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us some time and, and best of luck to you, uh, moving forward as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you so much for watching and be sure to tune in next Wednesday at noon as I'll be joined by Iowa State alum Michael Zahar, who works as the lead quantitative analyst of the new Integrative Baseball Performance Department for the Major League Baseball team, the Philadelphia Phillies. Have a great rest of your week and go Cyclones! This series is made possible by members of the Alumni Association. If you are interested in staying connected to the university and receiving all the benefits and services of being a member, visit isualum.org.